Welcome to PJ's Worship, a virtual worship experience brought to you by the First Congregational Church of Dudley, Massachusetts, a United Church of Christ church. Live, it's on YouTube. So tell your friends, everybody's always welcome at this church, no matter where you are on your journey. Um, I tend to travel around a lot to different churches. Last week I was in a church, 8 o'clock I was at, in Worcester, 10 o'clock I was in Auburn. You know, next week, I, here I'm today, next week I'm up in Gardner, week after that I'm back in Oxford. So just happy to be here today. David sends, of course, his greetings to everybody. He, of course, is very high risk and has a lot of trouble in this air, so he will be watching it from home. So, welcome, welcome, welcome. Let us pray. Lord of all power and might, the author and giver of all good things, graft in our hearts the love of your name, increase in us true knowledge, nourish us with all goodness of your great mercy, keep us in the same. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you, in the unity of the Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Forgive us our trespasses, they our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us away from temptation. Deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory for an ever and ever. Amen.
Summer conversation. So um, my topic today is on faith. So my question is, when has faith, what is faith to you? When have you felt its presence in your life? Has it helped you? Has it not helped you? Okay, so the topic is open for you. Wide open topic on faith. What is it? And we're all silent. In the stillness of the world, we hear God speaking. So, so um, I will give you a little acronym that I learned in my own confirmation class. Is forsaking all, I trust him. Keep that in mind. You'll hear more about it in my sermon. Um, it is? Oh, good. Okay. <laughs> um, a long time ago, back in the 90s, I, I was diagnosed and treated for a brain tumor. And so I was terrified, of course. And I got through it just fine, but that's one of the reasons I don't serve communion and I don't keep my balance very well and I don't hear it all in my left ear. And my face is a little damaged. But during that time, I learned a whole lot about faith because everybody, you know, carried me. And I couldn't have gone through that, sorry, couldn't have gone through that alone. And I think for many people, the way we carry each other in our trials is a wonderful thing. Thank you. Thank you, Peggy. Anybody who's seen Kindergarten Cop, you don't have a tumor. <laughs> Anybody else? Come on, there must be some more people with faith. Uh, belief in, in the unseen, hope in the unseen. That's what faith means to me. And not quite like as uh, severe as Peggy's life-threatening, I assume, situation. There have been times when faith has carried me through. Anybody else? I think for, is this on? Yeah. I think for me, faith is um, when you pray and you want the answer to be yes and it's no. And then you say, okay, well, I guess I have faith that the no answer is really the plan and really is going to lead to a bigger yes, so. Very good, Steve. Very good. Anybody else? No? I, I have faith. Um, they say that I've got stage four uh, metastatic adenocarcinoma. And I finally went out online and looked that up. And uh, one of the questions you get when you do a search is you get frequent questions that are asked. And one of the questions was, how many people are still living five years later? And the answer to that was 32%. One out of three. So I just wanted to let all you people, faith or no faith, know that I'm going to be one out of the three. <laughs> Uh, G Jesus makes it so. Um, and, and, and I believe myself to be a person of strong faith. Um, there's many times recently when uh, I've just, I, I've learned, you know, Homer Simpson, don't, you know, it's like, 
you know, when, when we have issues or we have problems, if we turn them over to God, like you said, Steve, we may not always get the answer that we expect. It may not always be yes, maybe no, but I believe that God has a plan for all of us. I'll tell you a cute little story. I was going to save this till next week, but, you know, you're here a week early. So um, next week's topic is it's your choice. I'm going to be working on that for the rest of this week. Um, it was, uh, I believe, Tuesday evening. Uh, the neuropathy is a little worse in my feet. And I got up to go to the bathroom about 4 in the morning. And um, I always try and make sure that I'm awake before I get up. Um, because there's a danger of a fall. Um, but I fell backwards, and the next thing I knew, I, I found myself sitting on the toilet bowl. And of course, when I fell backwards, I fell against the lid for the toilet seat, um, and I cracked the toilet bowl. I mean, this, this was like Titanic. You know, hey, hey Jack, come back. You know, Bob, come back. And water from the toilet tank went everywhere. I had to get up and shut it off. And this is a thing, you know, nowadays, you know, contractors have so much work, and there are still so many people that are looking for help. And I said, oh, man, how long is this going to take for me to get this toilet tank uh, fixed? But anyways, I said to myself, you know, God, you're in charge. Uh, Jesus, you're in charge. And uh, I called three contractors. Two of them called me back that afternoon. I first come, first serve, you know. Um, and the person I got, I said, you know, we, we bought these toilets uh, at a local um, chain hardware store. You know, I can get another toilet, you know, uh, when can you come and repair it? The guy says, I'll be there tomorrow morning if you have the toilet. So I called and let him know I'd, I had the toilet. And he came the next morning and fixed my toilet bowl. Turn around in less than 24 hours. I mean, that, that, that's my Lord and Savior Jesus at work. You know, I had, I can't claim that I did anything other than make a couple of calls. Anyways, um, Louisa, you know, faith, uh, it's a great topic for this morning. And uh, I appreciate all of you giving, your, giving me your time and your attention. And I do appreciate all the prayers, as does Bill. I believe that prayer works. Um, so anyway... Uh, God bless you all for being here on this warm uh, Sunday morning, uh, a communion Sunday uh, at that. Bob, I'm going to add to that. When I, when I called Bob, I said, okay, I know you were going through treatments and stuff. Would, is this the right call to make to ask him to assist me? And literally, I had faith that he would be able to do it. And so here he is. Bob and I have always done the service. He's always been my reader when I preached here. So, uh, Bob, I'm happy and grateful that you are here today to work with me. So, thank you, and thank you to God for that. You said you'd come, share all my sorrows. You said you'd be there for all my tomorrows. I came so close to sending you away, but just like you promised, you came there to stay. I just had to pray. And Jesus had come to the water, stand by my side. I know you are thirsty, 
won't be denied. I felt every teardrop when in darkness you cried. And I strove to remind you that for those tears I died. Your goodness so great I can understand. And dear Lord, I know that all this was planned. I know your it out always will be. Your love loosed my chains, and in you I'm free. But Jesus, why me? And Jesus said, come to the water, stand by my side. I know you are thirsty, you won't be denied. Felt every teardrop when in darkness you cried. And I strove to remind you that for those tears I died. Jesus, I give you my heart and my soul. I know that without God, I'd never be whole. Savior, you've opened all the right doors. And I thank you and praise you from earth's humble shores. Take me, I'm yours. And Jesus said, come to the water, stand by my side. I know you are thirsty, you won't be denied. I felt every teardrop when in darkness you cried. And I strove to remind you that for those tears I died. And Jesus said, come to the water, stand by my side. I know you are thirsty, you won't be denied. Build every teardrop when in darkness you cried. And I strove to remind you that for those tears I die. Always honored, always honored to help Louisa out. Um, this morning, uh, our scripture reading is from the Gospel of Luke, uh, chapter 12. We've kind of been working our way through Luke um, recently. Uh, chapter 12, verses 32 through 40. Faith is not a personal matter. It is not for us alone. It requires an external outcome. In this reading, all the yous are plural. Jesus is not talking about what we do as individuals, but about what the disciples should be doing as a group. He tells them that they all should be ready. Faith is not a solo activity, but rather a community event. There is great strength and joy in serving one another and the world together in Jesus' name. Here, the scripture reading this morning from, again, from Luke 12, verses 32 through 40, from the Revised Standard Version, because there's a nice 
Bible up here with big print. Um, so, here we go. Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give alms. Provide yourselves with purses that do not grow old, with a treasure in the heavens that does not fail, where no thief approaches and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Let your loins be girded and your lamps burning, and be like men who are waiting for their master to come home from the marriage feast, so that they may open to him at once when he comes and knocks. Blessed are those servants whom the master finds awake when he comes. Truly, I say to you, he will gird himself and have them sit at the table, and he will come and serve them. If he comes in the second watch or in the third and finds them so, blessed are those servants. But know this, that if the householder had known at what hour the thief was coming, he would have been awake and would not have left his house to be broken into. You also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour that you do not expect. Bless this reading and hearing of your Holy Scripture, Lord, to our hearts and to our souls for your understanding. Amen. When I was a child, suitcases were all those hard cases with the metal latches. Remember them? They were fine if you only packed a few items. But when you were packing for a trip, they never seemed to close. It always seemed that you had more items to fit in the suitcase than there was room for. And it inevitably led to the packer yelling out at some point, I need somebody to sit on the suitcase. I loved that I was always picked. I was the younger child, and I got picked to say, I thought it was great fun. But for my father, who was struggling to do it, or whoever was struggling at the time, not so much for him. So it was frustrating. And then meeting no success, sun items always had to be left out. And then there was the anxiety. Well, which to leave out? What should I do? Oh, maybe I need that one. Should I leave out this? It was confusing. And then suitcases did a wonderful thing. Somebody had the brilliant idea to now make suitcases with soft sides and a zipper so that when you stuffed them, the suitcase sides would bulge out. <gasps> Eureka, I can fit more stuff in. Okay? But then suitcases, knowing this, got larger and bigger, and then they had the handles and straps and everything. There's always just so much stuff that you have to carry with you. Well, throughout the years, I have learned that I don't need to pack all that stuff if I go anyplace. If a suitcase isn't involved, my entire life does not have to be packed into that suitcase. And I will note that, yes, there have been times, I mean, I haven't traveled in many years, but there are times when there are spaces left in the suitcase. And then it's like, oh, I have a space. Maybe I can fit something else in. So it's a never-ending cycle with that always having the need to fill every space that we have with stuff. When David and I were first married, we went on a trip home to Long Island. We were living in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania at the time, and we traveled home to Long Island to visit my parents to stay for a few days. At the end of the visit, my mother, of course, and I will say this because, yes, I'd say she's an Italian mother, but yes, my mother is an Italian mother, right? That makes me half Italian, so I can say this because I know what it's like. She always had tons of prepared meals that she had spent hours and hours and hours, and you'll appreciate this, endless amounts of vegetables that she made into soup and froze and everything else to send along with us because, of course, her darling daughter would starve, she felt. And so we had everything packed. 
The cooler was filled to the brim with the frozen meals prepared. The suitcase was filled with the end of all this stuff. We were ready to leave, getting in the car, and my mother yelled out, wait, you forgot this fish. Okay, we lived on Long Island, you know, 10 minutes from the ocean, up here, with my father always having the fresh fish. My father was from Norway, by the way, so he was very fussy with his fish. I would bring it home and it would be prepared and it would be frozen solid because, of course, again, the darling daughter would starve to death if she didn't have this fish. So I said to her, Mom, I love you. It's fine. We're packed to the brim with this fish. We don't need that fish. You and Dad can eat it. You can save it for next time. You can do, have a party, eat it right now, but there's no room for the fish. Well, she insisted the fish had to go along with us and that in the very frozen state, that fish would be just fine traveling six and a half hours back to Gettysburg. And we would be able to then unpack it and take it out. Well, it was transitioning between winter and spring. And yes, it was a long drive back. And so when we got back, we unpacked the car, we unpacked the suitcase, you know, the clothes. We forgot, we unpacked the cooler and went to bed, never thinking about the fish that she had stuffed in the back of the suitcase, in the little pocket. See an empty space, she found room for it. Weeks went by. You know the weather we're having today? Picture this and about 40 more degrees on top of it. Because we had packed the suitcases in our little storage bin, the top floor of the attic in the dorm, with no ventilation. So think of what would happen to a frozen fish that was there, a fresh fish that was frozen. And so weeks went by, and it turned into hot weather in Gettysburg. We had to go upstairs to get the clothes out of the attic, the shorts and the t-shirts, and get rid of the winter stuff. We climbed up the stairs. Something smells kind of funny, and it's not good. We opened the door to the attic. Smell was stronger. Got closer to our storage bin, and we looked at each other, and we went, the fish! We forgot the fish. Well, needless to say, it was not in a good state by then. We threw out the suitcase in a hurry, in the dumpster outside, everything. And to this day, David and I have been married 40 years now. To this day, we don't know how we didn't get in trouble, that nobody caught on to this fish smelling and traced it to us during that time. God was with us, that's all I can say. But anyway, that was the story of the fish. And so, we learned sometimes there's just too much stuff, no matter where you pack it. Okay. So what does this say about our need to have so much stuff? Every magazine, just about every magazine, you find you know, on those aisles at the end of the supermarket, and you read the headlines as you're waiting, Okay, besides the divorce rumors and the royalty rumors and everything else, Hollywood rumors, there's always an article that says, how to organize your stuff, how to decrease the stress over so much stuff, what to do with your stuff. You'll be saved, you'll be spared, all the anxiety over your stuff. They all have it. So, do we read them? Yes. Do we come home and buy them? Yes. And then we read them, and then we save those articles. And what does that do? The average person has approximately 3,000 documents at home adding to the more stuff that we really don't need. But still we buy, and we collect, and we store. Our homes are filled with gadgets that promise to make our life easier, but then what happens? We have to work two or more jobs to pay for that stuff. And what if we can't pay for that stuff in cash? Well, there's the plastic cards. And if that doesn't work, there's loans. If you are like our household, we get probably five to 15 ads a week for credit cards, pre-approved. You know, by now you would think some of them would realize, I don't want those cards. 
because I never accept them, you know? And then you get the ones also in addition to that, the loans. You know, and David and I are so fortunate to get so many because we have separate last names. So we get doubles and triples because they haven't figured anything out yet, you know? But anyway, it's our way of life. We buy and we collect and we store. It's a way of life for us. And I'm using us generic, it's not just me and David. <clears throat> And so we are often willing to risk everything we have in order to gain what we really want. At, what, at that point, we question what our motivation is for having that. And when our riches become the most important force in one's life, the practice of idolatry is present, whereas a relationship with God ought to be the ultimate goal. The people in the gospel are taking great risks. The servants are tired. They've had a hard day, and they just want to go to bed and sleep. But instead, they're supposed to stay awake until the master comes home at who knows what time from a wedding he's been attending. The master wants them to stay awake so he can see them on duty, and we're told he's going to be so happy. And how will they feel to know the master is so happy? But the servants just want to go to bed. The risk of going to sleep is real for them. And there are problems in that, though. The fact is, though, in their life and in our lives, it is easier and safer, it seems, to not take risks. But what would life be without taking risks? It would be the husband and wife who, although wanting a child, would never have one for fear of the perils that child might face in life. It would be the brilliant surgeon who would not operate for fear of losing a patient. It would be the aspiring actress who would not go to an audition for fear of forgetting a line. It would be the ambitious employee who would not ask for a raise for fear of being turned down. Without risks, there is no failure, but there is no room for growth either. And without growth, there is no life, no kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is what gives us purpose and meaning. God risked himself in Jesus so that we could have his kingdom. It's a gift that's freely given, a gift that has no price, a gift that we cannot buy. And he calls us to risk ourselves again and again and again, so that his kingdom might be proclaimed in our lives. Even the times when we are afraid to give of ourselves, God reminds us of his love for us in Jesus. And that love is the kingdom of God come alive for us. All God wants us to do is try. And that way he says you shall win that prize in life. There are so many choices in life, and with them, so many decisions to make. Loretta LaRoche, who, if you know her, anybody know her? Anti-stress comedian. And she actually lives and works here in Massachusetts. And um, she has many books out. She's had programs on PBS and stuff, which is where I first discovered her many years ago. But she points the problem out of having so many choices in life with comparing when she was a child to having breakfast to a child of today. When she was young, she said, the choice from her mother was, do you want breakfast or not? <laughs> Case closed. But what about today? The child is asked by the mother, what would you like to eat? Do you want cereal or eggs? If the child says cereal, the mother will continue. Do you want Fruit Loops, Cheerios, Rice Krispies, Wheaties, you name it, with or without fruit? A banana? How about strawberries? Do you want strawberries? I could put them on. Do I have blueberries? I could do that. What about a pineapple? Do you want a pineapple? Because if you want a pineapple, I could cut it up and put it on top, including the stem. I could do it. By that time, the child's 
you know, childs live in the moment, so they're not really thinking about all the choices. But anyway, the list goes on. A while back, I was in a store, and in one of the aisles, a young girl about three years old was with her mother. And the mother asked this girl, what would you like? Picture a little girl about three years old just going, so many choices, so many choices. I don't know what she picked. I didn't stay long enough. But there is always a case that whatever we choose, there's going to be so much better. I watch, yes, and David watches it with me, bless his heart, say yes to the dress. We just watched an episode of it the other night. The person had already tried on 200 dresses and been to I don't know how many stores. She came to Kleinfeld's where there are like 16,000 dresses or whatever because what else is there? Sometimes you just have to make a decision and go with it. There is a well-known piece that says, One night I dreamt that you and I were walking along the beach, Lord, and I was talking about my life. When everything was going smoothly, I noticed that there were two sets of footprints in the sand. But when things were going rough for me, and I was experiencing all the turmoil of life, I noticed there was only one set of footprints. Can you tell me, Lord, why when I was going through all this trouble and I needed you, why was there only one set of footprints? Why did I walk alone? And the Lord answers, the times when you saw only one set of footprints with the times that I carried you. We're not alone. We're not neglected. We are not left for poor. Our relationship with Christ is what makes us rich. He's there to guide us, support us, encourages people as we take risks. And so in our richness, in our relationship with Christ, Christ, we are now enabled to place, be placed first in our lives. This is important, what I say next, because I don't want anybody leaving this sanctuary this morning or listening to me on YouTube or whoever saying, <sighs> she said we have to get rid of everything we own. I'm not saying that. Jesus is not saying that. God is not saying that. Okay? He does not demand that our riches be given up. But the gospel lesson seems to present more problems and questions than answers. What do we do with all our stuff? And how do we view our possessions? That's when we need to deal with the issue at hand. What is the ultimate concern for Christians? For the gospel writer, the answer is clear, God's kingdom. It's God's pleasure to include us in his kingdom, and because of this, we are to manage our possessions and time accordingly. According to the norms of society, a person's worth is measured by cars, houses, boats, technology, etc. As Christians, too, our concern all too often seems to be divided between making more money and trying to find just enough time to enjoy all the stuff we just had to have. In the end, then, our possessions end up possessing us. Our ultimate concern, though, becomes that which we have accumulated, that which is fleeting and disposable. And Jesus challenges such concerns. To Jesus, pleasure is not that which comes from the accumulation of things, but originates in God's decision to include us in his kingdom. The call is not to hoard possessions, but it's also not a demand to asceticism. It is a call to free ourselves from anything which threatens our ultimate concern for God's kingdom. According to Jesus, where we place our treasure, we place our heart. If our hearts are set on our treasure, there is where we place our heart. But if our hearts are set on putting our possessions, you know, not first in our life, then our ultimate concern can become God's kingdom. The movement from viewing our possessions as our top priority to God's kingdom is not as unnatural as it might seem because it's all under God's rule. The call to be prepared for Jesus' coming is not a call to get right with God before it's too late. 
It's not a warning that Christians should never go to the movies or to dances or ever own anything. Because Jesus might come while we are out, and therefore we might miss him. To prepare for the coming is to place our ultimate concern in God's kingdom. To watch for the coming of Christ is to live today knowing that God has prepared a future beyond today. To be ready for Jesus' coming means to be eagerly awaiting the fulfillment of God's promises. The fair solution of our Lord is to give us more than we would have expected, a richness which outlasts everything else. Our treasure is the kingdom of God, now and forevermore. And so we will keep our stuff piled high. We will get more stuff and peruse articles on organizing our stuff. We will hold yard sales to sell our stuff and go to garage sales to come home with more stuff. The cycle will continue. So how do we keep our priorities straight? Consider this. Our stuff is found in stores, but God is everywhere. Our stuff is obtained when we go out and get it, but God is always present. Our stuff entertains us, but God cares about us. Our stuff is made in factories, but God makes new lives, mends wounded hearts, repairs broken homes, and builds us a mansion, as he has promised. Our stuff fills up space. God fills our heart. Our stuff fulfills its usefulness and is tossed aside, but God stays with us always. I'd rather have Jesus than silver or gold. I'd rather be his than have riches untold. I'd rather have Jesus than houses or land. I'd rather be led by his nail-pierced hands. I'd rather have Jesus than worldly applause. I'd rather be faithful to his dear cause. I'd rather have Jesus than worldwide fame. Yes, I'd rather be true to his holy name. So do not be afraid, little flock. Jesus is not speaking to just one individual. He is speaking to all his disciples and in turn is speaking to all of us. Treasures on earth will pass away, but God's loving promise is eternal. Is there really a comparison? May we never lose sight of our greatest treasure, God's kingdom, now and forever. Amen. As we pray, when I say, merciful God, please respond with, receive our prayer. Trusting in God's extraordinary love, let us come near to the Holy One in prayer. Let your loving kindness be upon your church. Fill all who proclaim the gospel with your spirit. Equip your flock to speak your word of promise and hope in the midst of fear and uncertainty. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Let your loving kindness be upon your creation. Dwell among us and sustain our earthly home. In places of famine, provide nourishment. In places of plenty, fashion us to be good stewards of your bounty. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Let your loving kindness be upon your world. Be our helper and our shield in places torn by strife and violence. Raise up courageous leaders to govern with compassion and justice. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Let your loving kindness be upon your children. Look upon all who wait for your steadfast love. Console those who grieve and embrace those who cry out to you, especially those we name in our hearts or aloud. Help us to trust your promise and not be afraid. Merciful God, let your loving kindness be upon this community. Fashion our hearts to strive for the way of peace. Strengthen the outreach ministries of churches and all who care for those in need. Merciful God, with thanksgiving we remember all who have died in faith and now rest in you. 
as they place their hope in you, so strengthen us to trust in your promise of new life. Merciful God, receive the prayers of your children, merciful God, and hold us forever in your steadfast love. Through Jesus Christ, our holy wisdom. Amen. At this time, is the offering collected still, or is it just placed out there? So we will collect our offering. And we ask that you give as you are able. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for your love that compels us to come in. Our hands were unclean, our hearts unprepared. We were not even fit to eat the crumbs from under your table. But you, Lord, are the God of our salvation and share your bread with sinners. Sinners, Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who in your tender mercy gave your only Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, to suffer death upon the cross for our redemption, who made there by his sacrifice proof of the primacy of faith over secular devotion for the sake of human wholeness. He instituted and in his holy gospel commanded us to continue a perpetual memory of his precious death until he comes. Amen.
Hear us, merciful Father, we humbly pray and grant that we receiving these gifts of your creation, the bread and this wine, according to your Son, our Savior, Jesus' holy institution, in remembrance of his death and this passion, may be partakers of his most blessed body and blood, who in the same night that he was betrayed, took bread and gave you thanks. He broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup And when he had given thanks, he said, Drink this, all of you. This blood is my body given for you, for all creation, for the remembrance of the sins that you have and that I redeemed you for it. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. So at this point, the deacons will hand out the bread and then the wine. We ask that you take it. the body of Christ given for you. Take and eat. Next, the juice will be passed out to people. Please hold it for the blessing of that. The blood of Christ shed for you. Take and drink. Let us pray. Jesus, bread of life, we have received from your table more than we could ever ask. As you nourished us in this meal, now strengthen us to love the world with your own life. In your name we pray. Amen.
We join in singing the closing hymn. coming. Go and spread the good news. Thank you for being our acolyte today, carrying the light of Christ into our sanctuary and out into the world. Thank you to Bob for assisting me today and the deacons. And Bob back there. Um, this is when I love technology because I wanted David to be here singing and he made it possible for him to join us. So thank you, Bob, for your help and your guidance. And bow your heads and receive the benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Mm -hmm.